remember every day, everything great about you. Yeah. Don't, don't believe it, just don't believe it. <laughs> Thank you. Don't believe a word of what he said about me. <laughs> right, oh. In how? That's the, one of the two words I know. <laughs> it's really an honor and a privilege for me to be here. Um, especially because I know that um, this university is very productive in research, in educational research. Um, I'm the editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Design and Technology Education, Technology and Design Education Bodies. Um, and I see several articles from Taiwan flowing in regularly. So you're really productive in educational research. So I know that this university is really, this group is really a high level under the uh, excellent leadership of Professor Lin, and uh, I know him for a long time already. We just discussed how long ago it was, like more than 10 years or so. So it's a very long standing relation, and I appreciate very much the work he's doing, and, uh, and also appreciate the invitation to be here. So it's, it's really uh, a very nice time that I have here. Um, I'm, I'm uh, taken care of by two students uh, who took me around and showed me a lot of Taipei. Uh, we did more walking than she could have, but uh, that was my fault, because <laughs> I'm used to walk. When you put me in a city somewhere in the world, I'll walk all day long. So uh, that's, that was great. And um, I'm happy to be here in a country with Chinese culture, because I really admire Chinese culture. Um, and in fact, I have five favorites that I will list here. Um, I really love your writing. We, we, in Europe, we have this dull alphabet with A, B, C, etc. So, uh, and so always when I see this, is very nice, of course, because it's calligraphy. Um, but even when I see your normal writing in print, it is so beautiful. Every every character is like a little picture. So it's it's really I, 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 It's difficult for me to learn it, so I bought myself a book called Chinesey. <laughs> And still it was difficult for me, so, uh, but I, I love the way you write it, it's so beautiful. And then my second favorite is your art. This, this is uh, really so nice. But, uh, actually, my son-in-law has one that is almost like this, he has it on the wall. And I also have some in my room, and I really love this. All these, these misty mountains and this uh, river flowing. Sometimes you have with, with very little people here, of, I was one time at the National Palace Museum and there was one stretched out meters long with a whole story of it and that was really, really lovely. So this is my favorite two. And favorite three is, is the music with the very special instruments. Um, so I've been happy to buy some CDs here again because I, I really love your music. It's so nice, these special instruments that you only have in Chinese culture. So it's really, really wonderful. And then Chinese food. We have Chinese restaurants in the Netherlands. They they sell something that they call Chinese food. <laughs> but I know now that Chinese food is only served here. <laughs> so when you want to have real Chinese food, you have to come to countries like Taiwan and then I enjoy this. So I, I really love this. It's, we had a wonderful meal this, this afternoon also. So that's really. But my real favorite, of course, is the people. <laughs> Always when I come to countries like Taiwan. It's always these friendly, hospitable people. I'm almost amazed by your hospitality. There's people taking care of you 24 hours almost a day. Um, always kind and nice to work with, nice to chat with. So really, you are, uh, and it's, it's well known, of course, that the Chinese people are very, very uh, polite, but also kind, and so you're, you're warm. You're, you're really, really special kind of people that I, I always love to be in, in, in Taiwan. So it's just, I'm having a great week now. It's really fantastic. So I can see all these beautiful things. Um, so that's that's for me. This is a great week. There's, there's a little connection between um, our countries. Uh, in fact, even between the place where I work. And, oh, sorry, I'm just use this one. Um, yeah. Got stuck in Chinese culture. How could that be? Yeah. No. It's not moving. This, this is not the end of my presentation yet. <laughs> it's just that we've developed a technical problem. But well, we're in technology education, right? So there should be no problem. Right? Oh, 
city in the Netherlands where we have a, a university of technology and Delft is famous, world famous for its Delft blue earthenware, porcelain. Actually it was stolen from China <laughs> because when Dutch came to Formosa as we called it then and made in China, the people there, the merchants, found this beautiful earthenware and they thought like how oh, we can take this home and then we can make that by ourselves. So people first also made Chinese cactus on it, dragons and the like, but at a certain moment they started putting windmills on it, that's a real the Dutch theme, you might say. And they choose one particular color of blue, that is called Delft blue now, and this is sold worldwide now. <laughs> but it was, that's called Delft blue, it's stolen from China. So, apologies for that, but <laughs> we're almost as famous now for our porcelain as you are, but it was your idea originally, so. Okay, let me acknowledge that. It was your idea, not ours. Now, um, now to the subject. I'm, I'm going to talk about STEM, because I know that there is an interest in STEM here. I, I gave a whole list of topics that I could talk about, and the, the choice was clearly STEM, but particularly, of course, we're here in the technology education domain, so we would like to discuss what, what could the, the role of T, and I also include E in that, in this new thing called STEM, and or STEM or STEAM, you also see STEAM now, yesterday we visited the school that had the STEAM program, then the A of Arts is there, um, so I've left that out because STEM is a more, let's say, traditional term, as far as it, there is any tradition, of course, it's all relatively new, um, but I thought just for convenience I will use STEM rather than STEAM, and it's interesting because this team, this, this term is very confusing, because people use it in very different ways. Usually what it means is S plus T plus E plus M. Just the four separate domains, but they're put in an order that makes it pronounceable, so you can call it STEM. It might just have well been MEST or METS or whatever, but they call it STEM because then it's pronounceable. Um, but it often means just the separate domains that we still have in schools. Uh, uh, there's a little problem here because we have science education traditionally, we have mathematics education traditionally, then since some decades we have technology education, we are the relative newcomers you might say. We don't have engineering education in, in primary or secondary schools. So this E is a funny thing because we don't have that. We, we know science education, we know math education, we have teachers for math and science. No secondary school or primary school has an engineering teacher. So that's something funny because we've put it in here for good reasons, I think. So I'm also going to talk a little bit about what, how, what, why is the E different from T? Is E just not one kind of technology, but just a bit more exact, a bit more serious, a bit more heavy, you might say? Well, I think there are differences, especially when you talk about technology education and engineering education. Of course, we have engineering education, but that's in tertiary education only, and in higher education. That, that's where we have engineering education. So what, what is this thing? And then I'm also going to use it in a kind of different way because you can you can use STEM in the meaning of S plus T plus E plus M. But I'm also going to suggest that in education we should take up the challenge to move towards integrated STEM, as it's sometimes called. Because otherwise, why put the four together if there is no connection between them anyway? I could just put any other school subject also there because there's also no connection with history education or economic, or economic education or whatever. So why, why do we put them there? Because the idea is, of course, that they are connected. Or at least they should be connected. But how? That's the big question. And that's what we struggle with now. That's what you can see schools struggling with. And in the university, we struggle with that. How do we properly connect the four? How can we think of activities that can really be seen as an integration of the four, not just separate parts of the project that are still recognizable as the science part or the mathematics part or the technology part, 
no really integrated STEM activity. Some people even call it I-STEM, integrated STEM, small i, capital ST, etc. But how to do that? That's what we struggle with. We struggle with that in the Netherlands, in Taiwan, internationally, so it's good to reflect on what are possible ways to go. Now, I, I'm, I'm going to tell a little bit about my background because that will help you understand the kind of things I'm, I'm saying. In my university, I have a chair for science and technology education. So my primary task is to lead a teacher education program for science and technology and mathematics and also lead our educational research. So I also have my PhD students who do research in science education and technology education and math education. Uh, we have them in, in one group. That's the nice thing because our group is already a sort of an integration because we have science students, technology students, mathematics students, future teachers, all in the same group. And, and we mix them deliberately to, to let them get to know each other's domain. So that's one way you can realize integration, of course, by mixing the students. That's, that's one way. But I have a second chair, and that second chair is about philosophy of technology. That's a bit funny, of course. It's not common to have two different chairs with two very different fields, but I try to combine them. Because I think the domain of philosophy of technology is very useful if you want to see the connections between technology and science and mathematics. Because in philosophy, we try to reflect on the nature of technology. And it's very much in the nature of technology to have a link with science and with mathematics. So the reason I went into philosophy of technology, and in the end even got a chair for that, professor's chair, is that I think it is very useful to look at the ideas that in philosophy of technology were developed to understand what technology really is, also in its connection to science and mathematics, so that when we look for a good conceptual basis for integrated STEM, we can borrow ideas from these philosophers. So I'm going to talk a bit about the nature of technology, the nature of science, how do they match, and how do they differ, and I'm also going to compare technology and engineering. Is that the same? But nowadays there's also a domain called philosophy of engineering. That's even newer than philosophy of technology. Philosophy of technology is like, let's say, 30, 40 years old now. And philosophy of engineering is perhaps only 10 years old. But that's even newer. So really look at the difference between technology in general and engineering specifically. So that's the background from which I'm going to talk. So I'm going to tease you a little bit of a bit of philosophy, not very deep, but worry. But I'm going to show you that there are ideas there that we may want to use when we want to get some more clarification about how STEM could be integrated. Now, why at all do we want that? Let me, let me start. What's the fuss? Why, why do we have all this talk about STEM? Why do we think it's relevant? I think there's good reasons. And I've listened to a couple of them here. And these are fairly international. I'm sure you will recognize them for Taiwan also. And if not, you just tell me and I'll learn about the Taiwanese situation. And the first reason I think is the most important one. If you look at reality, the world around us, you don't see separate science. You don't see separate engineering. You don't see separate mathematics. You see people doing things that integrate them all. I have written a history of the research laboratory of the Philips Electronics Company. I've spoken to people who work there and who literally told me that when they were working on projects about lighting or other kinds of electronics, they literally said to me, actually, when I was working, I could not tell you whether I was doing science or engineering. It was just one integrated activity. So yes, in universities, we have science and we have mathematics, and we have engineering disciplines, separate. But in real life, they're integrated, except for schools. In schools, we also have separate science teachers, separate mathematics teachers, separate technology teachers. But in real life, these are not separate. Also, when you look around in the world, around you, you won't see something that you can say, ah, that here is science, here is technology, here is engineering, here is mathematics. No, it's nonsense. Everything that is here is the result of all of that together. So real life is not split up in disciplines, it is all integrated. So if we want to prepare our 
students and pupils in, in primary and secondary schools for living in the normal world, outside school, outside university, it's all integrated. So we have to show them how in this integrated world you can recognize how science contributes to it, how engineering contributes to it. But they will find it all integrated. So we also have to show them how it is that integrated. Why is it that these Phillips people could not tell me whether they were doing science or mathematics or engineering? How come? How, how is it possible? Because they were trained as a scientist, or as an engineer, or a mathematician. And they started working at Phillips, and certainly these disciplinary boundaries disappeared. Because they were working there as people who worked in R&D, research and development. That's what they were doing. That's just so they were not cooking, they were not sewing or whatever, they were not agriculturists, but they were really R&D people. So to me, R&D is an example of an activity that is really integrated stuff, because the people working in it cannot tell me what they were doing, science or mathematics or engineering. So R&D, as it happens in industrial laboratories, for instance, is really an integrated STEM activity. So if you would ask me, can you give an example of an integrated STEM field? Yeah, R&D in the industry. That's why it's really integrated. So that could be also a nice domain of inspiration if we want to look at, well, how do these people work then? What do they do? So the real world is integrated, so I think in schools also we should teach pupils how this integration then takes place. If we do so, then a second reason comes up, because I think that will really show them why integrated study is so interesting. When I talk to these people in R&D, they talk about their work with warmth, with excitement. They, they, they've done things that they're really enthusiastic about. So that integrated STEM domain is, is really attractive because one of the reasons that they worked there is that they felt that they were doing so many different things that just took from science, took from mathematics, took from engineering, took from technology. So it was a very rich domain because it had all these elements in it. So rather than just doing science only, they thought it was much more exciting to work in this integrated domain. By the way, I think many science teachers also fail to show that scientists can also be enthusiastic. But then you would have to show them what the science is about, of course. Because often in science education, we just transfer the existing knowledge rather than showing how new knowledge is produced in science. So we teach them Ohm's law, Gabriel Sachs law, Newton's laws, and whoever's laws. But a scientist does not reproduce Ohm's law or Newton's laws or whatever. He's doing new research. He's trying to find new laws. That's what science is about. But I think that we don't show that very well in science education. It's much more the transfer of existing knowledge. And pupils very quickly say, that's not interesting. I can look that up in a book. Not exciting. The real excitement is finding this new knowledge. So I think science education could do much better. Yeah? I think in technology education, we are much better than science education. Because we show them what technology really is as a process. How you design new things, how you make things. Uh, most people think that science education with this long tradition is doing better. I think we're doing better. We're showing much more of what technology really is as a process. So now I come to my third point. Because, well, we, we, I say we are doing better in technology education, but at the same time, of course, I realize that we have a problem there. Because we are certainly not regarded as important as science. When you go to university, they will look at your science marks, not at your technology marks. Same here? I guess so. Yeah. So when you, when you go to our university, Delft University of Technology, they want you to have an A in science. And technology, even if you haven't had it, no problem, you can come here. Your science is important, your math is important, your technology, oh, well, it's nice when you've done it. You probably had a lot of fun, but uh, it wasn't very useful, wasn't it? We think, yes, of course, it was useful, but that's not the way the outside world sees it. So they still have the idea that technology is a lot of tinkering, it's a bit of woodwork, a bit of work, 
oh yeah, we did a little bit with robotics now yesterday, nowadays. Okay, so it becomes a little bit more sophisticated now, but still, science is the real thing, and that is the real thing. That's the important areas. So we, we have a problem. That could be solved, at least to a certain extent, when we get a better relation with science. In the Netherlands, at a certain moment, schools had the opportunity to integrate technology into science education. But that was disastrous for many technology education programs because then the science teacher took over and he just ticked off technology one afternoon. But when there was a strong technology education program with a good technology teacher, after the merger, he or she suddenly found him or herself in the domain of science. And the respect for that person grew immediately. Now he was in the same realm as science. So now he was important. So the status of technology education suddenly gets up when you get closer to the important people, science people. Also, um, that is probably my next slide. So this, for, for us, this is not a motive to do this. It may help us gain in status. Is that important? Yes, I think it is important to gain in status, yes, because we are not to look as that's the people that don't really matter. So, and we think that we do have a message, of course, because people live in a technological world. So, of course, what we're doing is important. But if we are the only ones that keep telling us to ourselves, that doesn't help us much. I mean, we need other people to say that. So, if other people are willing to say that because we're in the sale realm of science, okay, that's good for us. So, let's do it. Now, that sounds good. So, every reason to do step. But, 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 unfortunately, you can see there's more. But then, yes, and I'll, I'll list them here. We say it's good to team up with science and mathematics because they're important. But let's not forget, they also have a problem because they are seen as important, but they are certainly not popular with pupils. In general, pupils think that science and mathematics are boring. Boring to death. Even if you're allowed to do an experiment, know that the correct graph is already in the book and all surprises are excluded. You are not supposed to find any new knowledge. The only thing that is correct is when you reproduce the existing knowledge. Is that exciting? No, it's not. Not for pupils. And I said science education is doing a bad job in that respect because real science is not like that. Real science is really looking around, seeing things that you don't understand trying to get an explanation by collecting data, by doing experiments, etc. That's real science, but that's not what we do in schools. In schools we just reproduce, and students don't like that. They think it's boring. Lots of studies that science has an image problem. It's the opposite problem. We, we have a problem that we are very popular, but not seen as important. Science is seen as very important, not, not popular, not with students anyway. Parents think it's important, school board, universities think it's important, not humans, they don't like it. So it may be that we lose some of our popularity when we team up with science. That may spoil the fun if we're not careful. So we have to be careful. Let's not now surrender to the scientists and also start reproducing only. And, and there is temptation, of course, we can do that. We can show a picture of a refrigerator and say this is a refrigerator, this is how it works. This is that part, this is that part, that's exactly how it works. So also reproduce what is known already. Now in technology education, when we would be tempted to say, okay, so we need things to be cooled. So can we think of something that will help us cool stuff? So let's design something that cools. That would be technology, right? Not to tell this is a fridge, this is how it works could be tempting to do the same thing as science. And we should not do that, I think. But it's a danger, so we have to be careful. Same for mathematics. Mathematics is just using mathematics. You use knowledge about how to solve a solution, how to solve an equation, or how to calculate something. It's all reproducing. Nothing new comes out. That's not really mathematics, because these mathematics people are constantly looking for new ways to solve equations and new sorts of equations. That's real mathematics. But that's not what pupils get to see. They get to see only the dull side. So let's be careful not also to start reproducing things because that's what these other folks are doing. 
and, and they're also doing very abstract things. Well, they're improving definitely, of course, because science education books now look quite different. They have pictures of all sorts of real life situations. I still remember when I studied physics in, in secondary school, we had a textbook that had almost no images at all. And there were sometimes images that had only symbolic things, you know, just, just circles and, and, and little people that were drawn like, you know, a stick with a head on it, something like that. There, was, there were no real people in that textbook. That is different now. Of course, so science education has understood the message that you should relate to daily life. But where is the real connection with daily life? Mr. Thompson, that's us. So we, we should, you know, be the people that help these science people make the connection with real life. Because often it goes through technology. Not only, not only. Was it you that told me that we had seen a rainbow yesterday? That's beautiful, of course. A rainbow is a wonderful phenomenon, and there's no technology involved there. So if a science teacher would take the rainbow and said, wow, what's going on there? How does that, how does that work? Can, can we explain that? How, how does a rainbow work? What, can, can we figure that out? When, when does a rainbow appear? When does it rain, sir? No, that's not enough. There needs to be sun also. Oh, that's interesting. Um, and is there any connection between where the sun is and where the rain is? Uh, yeah, that's right, because they have to be in, in different directions. So I have to stand with my back to the sun and then in the direction of the rain. That's when I see the rainbow. Oh, okay, teacher says, how come? So you could have certain signs like that. Yeah. And it has no connection with technology. But that's an exception. Most of the connection is through technology. So we can help the science people to solve their problems. But then we have to make sure that we don't start doing it the way the science people do. We have to keep working our own way, connected to daily life, very much the process of what we do, not just conveying the existing knowledge. So the other hurdle is, of course, that we struggle with identity. That may be a reason for science teachers to say, do I want to work together with a technology teacher? Or will I lose my status then? Because clearly I have to step down. Because I'm way up here, and the technology educator is somewhere here. So when I have to work with him, I have to step down. Is, is that attractive for a science teacher? Maybe for this reason, but certainly not for gaining in status. So that may be a barrier. Yesterday we were at school, and, and they had a STEAM program, and we talked with the teacher. And so I asked them, do you cooperate with the science teacher? And the answer was more or less, well, no, the science teacher is not really so interested in that. And so we, we talked a bit more about it. Well, why, why work with us? Science is important in itself, so they don't need us. So there might be a barrier there. Maybe the science teacher will say, I'm not so sure if I want to work with them. There is this mysterious E that we know from engineering education, of course, but not from secondary education. There's no tradition in engineering education, in primary or secondary education. It's completely unknown. So now we talk about STEM. We know science, we know technology, we know mathematics, but this E, there's no examples of any kind of engineering curriculum that we can use as a starting point. There's only engineering education at tertiary level, but not in secondary school. So what, what do we do with the E? That's completely unknown terrain yet. No one has dropped that already, so it's completely new. So that's, that's also a struggle. Also, there is more to S than just the application in TME. So the science teacher will probably also wants to have his rainbow still. But we can't do anything with that. Uh, maybe we can, maybe we can think of applications of that knowledge. Because a trace smile, of course, is an application of rainbow, you might say. Is it really? Well, it's the same phenomena, so I don't know if it's really the application of that, but it's, it's the same scientific phenomena, so you could see the sort of relation. But there are other things that, that scientists are interested in that, that we're not directly involved in, maybe the weather or something like that, so it's areas where technology plays a small role only, and science probably wants to have that still. So there will be domains in science that do not easily connect to technology. And also the other way around, that is a lot of technology that does not involve much of science. I mean, when, when you design something like this, well, 
is there much science in this world? I mean, there is carpenters that know nothing about science, but they're quite well able to put together a nice table like this. So is there any science in that? Well, of course you can do science in it, but the carpenter will laugh you away and say, well, I don't do any calculations for myself. I'll just do a calculation for it. No physics. So probably we want to have our own thing also still. We don't want to give up our, our wood plant because we think it's important, but it's not important for the science. So it, it doesn't all overlap, you see, so there's, there's this domain within science that probably will stay outside the integrated STEM domain, and there's also part of our domain, which are also not so easy to connect to STEM. So there's couples there, and it's the same to mathematics. The mathematics teacher will tell you, well, I, I don't teach mathematics only for you, because the economy teacher is also interested in mathematics, so I'm also there for him or her. And if students start studying psychology, they also need to have no mathematics, so I also prepare them for that. And that's sometimes it's different. There's a lot of statistics in it that you may not be interested in. So there's more to mathematics than is in STEM. Now I come to teachers. There's an important hurdle there. Most technology teachers had little background in science, engineering, and mathematics. They were educated as technology teachers. They were very skilled to make things. They have knowledge about some technological concepts, but their science knowledge is rather thin. They will know the basics maybe because they have science in secondary school, but they're not as good as science, yet science teachers of course. So they quickly get lost when you come up with more advanced science. So there's a problem there. The technology teacher is not well prepared to do technology, to do the method, to do the science, sorry. That's why I sometimes hesitate when I see technology teachers delivering what they call STEM education. And I look at it critically and I say, hmm, is there real science in it? Maybe you have applied one formula, but is that really science? Does your activity lead to a better understanding of the scientific concept? I'm not so sure about that, because you don't really activate it, so you, you use it, but do you really make the pupils aware of that this science concept is, is also to be understood? I'm not so sure, because the technology teacher, him, him or herself, already has difficulties having a proper understanding of the concept himself. So he's, he's not the best person to teach the science in this project. Same for mathematics. Of course, all technology teachers can do basic calculations, but do they really have a good understanding? I know a lot of technology teachers who have the same science sort of conceptual misunderstandings in mathematics as their pupils have. And there's been a lot of research into conceptual misunderstandings in mathematics. It's very simple things that we ordinary people don't have quite well understand. But technology teachers also have the same problem. So they are not in the best position to teach mathematics. So often when I see technology teachers delivering what they call STEM educations, I have the strong impression that it's actually technology education with a little bit of S use and a little bit of N use. And many of these technology education people others have never seen engineers at work. They don't really know what engineering is about. They may have written a, read a, little, a book about it or something, but they have not seen the world of engineering really. They have never been to, let's say, a Boeing factory or to see the real engineering going on there. That's really unknown terrain for them. They're good woodwork teachers and other kind of things, but then the understanding of engineering, of let's say finite element modeling, that's very important in engineering, is something that they probably don't know. Exactly the other way around is the same because a science teacher probably has never designed something. So his understanding of design is practically zero. And even stronger for the mathematics teacher. The mathematics teacher certainly has never designed anything. It's completely new. So when I see science teachers deliver at STEM, I also think like, uh, do you really know what engineering is about? Do you know what design is about? And so they hesitate strongly to do that because they feel that their background in that is way too weak. So that's why I think that if we want to do real integrated STEM, we need all of these different teachers still. Because we don't have a STEM teacher, we have not a teacher that is educated as a STEM teacher, we have 
the science teaches to its death, the technology teaches to its death, the mathematics teaches to its death, but all in their own subject. And I think what really is necessary to have integrated STEM is to have these teachers bring together all their different domains in, in, in their own heads, in the models that they have, and then we'll have really to STEM. Now, finally, this is the one that is probably most challenging. I think it is not that easy to develop STEM activities in which they are actually integrated. I see a lot of STEM projects that are actually technology projects, and at a certain moment, it's almost like the students take a break, do an experiment that leads to a bit of science, and then they go back to the design work, and the experiment really didn't mean that much for the design. They just pick up where they left, and what are we, what are we doing? So, what are we doing? Well, we're doing STEM now, so, so we have to do some science. Okay, can we go back to the design now? Yeah, we can go back to the design now. So, there's no real impact of this, the science experiment on the design. They just picked up where they left, and it's called integrated because they had an activity in which they did some science, but it's, it's not, it didn't contribute to the design. And I see lots of those projects. I, I also see the STEM project in science, so it's actually all about learning science. And then they use examples from technology. So they say we do STEM because I have used the refrigerator as an example. How to show thermodynamics. And then of course we say, well, that's not really technology. Technology that you talk about, how, how is such a little thing designed? Why did it come about? What do customers want from it, etc. That's technology. But the science teacher doesn't know that. So does it in his own way. So he has a STEM activity, but actually it's a science education activity with a little bit of technology in it. Does the technology contribute to the understanding of science? No, not at all. It's just a technical background, but it doesn't really help that the physics teacher doesn't use the refrigerator to give a better understanding of the total energy, the thermodynamics. It's just a practical example. Look, this is where we supply it. See? No connection. So then, of course, we say, no, no, that's the wrong way of doing it. If we have to have activities in which there is a natural connection between them. Okay, where are they? I've seen lots of examples of technology, of, of STEM projects. But they were always either in technology or in science, and very often the integration was very thin. So I think we're still struggling. Nice projects, pupils are happy, so we, we are really making our way forward. There's definitely progression, so I'm not all negative. There's definitely progression. But we're certainly not there yet. There's still many projects that have poor integration. I'll give suggestions about how that can be changed. Now, now we get a little bit to the philosophy part because there is another hurdle that I think is important, and that is that we easily talk about the integration of science and engineering or technology, but let's not forget that they are really different. Just before this talk, we had a meeting about the, the processes of science and engineering, and they are alike. So when you look at the, what we call the empirical cycle in science, it looks very much like the design cycle in technology. So in that respect, the technology and science are almost analogous processes. But when you look at the content of what we're doing, there are some very, very deep differences between science and technology. So integrating them is not take for take for the technique for granted. It's really difficult. Let me show you some things. Science is very complex independent. Newton's laws hold everywhere, anytime. And that's what science wants. Science wants knowledge only that is applicable, that holds everywhere, anytime. So if you have a knowledge that is only useful for middle ages or only for now, or knowledge that only works on the North Pole, the scientist will say, okay, nice start, but we're not there yet. <laughs> For science, the stippet horizon is the grand theory of everything. <laughs> One theory that covers everything. The most general knowledge that is real science. Whereas we in engineering or technology say, no, our knowledge is much more context dependent. When I go to any of the engineering faculties on my campus, let's say we have a faculty of aeronautics. 
development in aircraft design. The kind of theories that these people use to design, let's say, a helicopter, are very much specific for helicopters. They have formulas that work for helicopters only. So when they design, let's say, an Airbus A350, they use different theories. Because it's different design, so it means different theories. In the end, of course, it is all related to Newton. So when you generalize from all these theories, then somewhere you meet Newton. But they're not interested in that. They're more interested in theories that are much closer to the design. These are much more applicable, much more useful. So the kind of knowledge that is used, that is developed in engineering is much more context dependent. So the physicist will say, that's not real physics. That's these practical engineers with their theories. But that's the kind of theories that we use in engineering. That's what we can use. Second, in science, truth is the criteria. When the theory is to be uh, accepted, you have to prove that, it, you prove that it's true, that it relates to the evidence, to the data. But in technology, our criteria is much more effective. Does it work? So we build bridges using classical mechanics. And the physicist will tell you that's not truth. We don't see that as truth anymore because we know that these particles all behave in a quantum way. But an engineer will say, I don't care because if I have to use quantum mechanics to design a bridge, there's never to be a bridge built anymore because it's way too complex. So I use classical mechanics because it's effective, not because it's true. I know that these particles don't behave that way. They behave in a quantum way. But I don't care because it's much more easy for me to use classical mechanics. So we're not interested in truth, we're interested in effectiveness. That's all about evidence-based is important in science, and in our, it's also decision-based. So, because part of our knowledge is about norms. Now, why do we have a norm? Because it's a decision we take. Why is the size of an A4 sheet of paper as it is? Is that a matter of an experiment we did, and we found out that an A4 paper is so much, so many inches by so many inches? No, it's just an agreement, a decision we made. That's something that flabbergasts the physicist. How can you base an outcome just on an agreement? It will just be like a physicist say, okay, can we agree on what the mass of an electron will be? Who votes for that? Who votes for that? That's, a, that's ridiculous, of course. You experiment and experiment decides. But when we say, okay, can we vote on the size of an A4 paper? That's the way it happened, of course. I'm in front, I'm in favor of that. I'm in favor of that. Okay, how much? Okay, majority is in favor of that. So, A4 sheet is like that. And from now on, we know it's a knowledge. A4 sheet is like that. Physicists cannot understand that. That's amazing. They, they, they cannot do that. Knowledge and science is always what we call propositional. It can be expressed in sentences or in formulas. In technology, we have a lot of knowledge that's non propositional. We cannot even turn it into words. An engineer can say, or a technician can say, I know how to hammer a nail into a piece of wood properly. That's a lie because I cannot do that. There are people who can say, I know how to hammer a piece of nail into a piece of wood. Can you put it into words? Can you write a manual for that? No. That also means, of course, that if you want to teach it, you cannot write a textbook for that. You cannot write a textbook for hammering a nail into a piece of wood. Why not? Because you cannot put that knowledge into words. Same like, I know how to ride a bike. That's something at least I can say in the conference. I know how to ride a bike. But when I taught my children to ride a bike, did I give them a list of instructions? First, you put your leg on one pedal, then you swing your leg over the bike. But at a certain moment, there is this mysterious moment that you have balance. I, I don't know how I do that. I know how to do it. I, I know exactly how to do it. But I cannot put it into words. It's non-propositional knowledge. And I cannot turn it into words. Good designers know how to tackle a design problem. But they cannot put it in words. They just look at the problem and say, I think it's best to start with looking at existing solutions here. Can you tell why? Can you get right to manual? I don't know, I've been designing for over 30 years, so I know it by experience. 
Do you have any theory about that? No. <laughs> I just look at the problem. I say, well, my gut feeling says I should start there. And he's always correct. Can you give you a theory about that? No, he cannot. There's no example. Then a very important one. Scientific knowledge is always non-normative. There's no normative elements in science, in, in science knowledge. Of course, there is norms for scientific knowledge. There is norms for when to accept something as a scientific theory. But there is no normativity in the scientific knowledge. A physicist will never say, I know that it, this is a good electron. That's nonsense. He, he's done an experiment, he says, this is an electron. But he's never talking about malfunctioning electrons or something like that. That's complete nonsense. In physics, you don't have an opinion on reality. You just describe reality as it is. So you look at different particles, you say, okay, here's a particle that from now on I call an electron. And you don't complain about particles not well functioning as electrons. When something is not behaving as an electron, it's simply not an electron. It's not a, it's not a bad electron or a malfunctioning electron. But in technology, we do talk about norms. An engineer can be perfectly right in saying, I know that this is a good drilling machine. And when it's not, well, when it's not functioning well, it is still a drilling machine. But it's not a functioning one because it doesn't drill properly. So engineers and technologists have an opinion on reality. They talk about good and bad devices, malfunctioning. So there's a big difference there. In science, you never talk about norms in the knowledge. And in technology, we do that all the time. Even when we talk about functions, then you realize that function is a normative notion. It's not descriptive. The function is a the function of a car is to bring me from A to B. And it still has that function when it's in the garage for repair. It cannot bring me from A to B at that moment, but it's still a car, so its function is still to bring me from A to B. It cannot do that. So function is not what a thing actually does, it is what a thing ought to do. And when it does that properly, it is a good car, and when it's not doing it properly, it's a broken car, or it's a bad car, or whatever it is. But it's still a car. So function is a normative notion. That's why physicists never talk about functions. Ah, wait, biologists do. But do they really mean functioning in the sense of what the thing ought to do, but they talk about the function of a heart. Do they really mean that the heart was designed by someone with a function to pump around that blood? No, they just mean that the heart is something that is a muscle that constantly contracts, and so the effect is that it pumps blood. That's what they call function. It's what we call functioning. It's what the thing does. But even in biology, Function is not a normative notion. The biologist doesn't talk about a bad heart. That is what a physician does, a doctor. He talks about good and bad hearts. But he's not a biologist. He's in medicine. Medicine is also normative activity. In medicine also we talk about normative things. We talk about healthy people, sick people. Biologist looks at cells. He doesn't say the cell is healthy or ill. That's for mentals people to know. Biologists just describe This cell does that. Here's a cell that keeps multiplying, keeps multiplying. It's only the doctor that says, oops, that's cancer. That's an illness. But biologist just describes. No normative knowledge. Not in engineering and not in medical sciences also. And we also talk about standards, about good practices, etc. So we have normativity in our knowledge. So, conclusion. Engineering and also technology, I closely related I'll talk about the difference shortly, but let's say let's take engineering now, is really different from technology. And so we, when we want the science teacher to work together with the technology teacher, both of them first need to get an understanding of these differences. Otherwise they, they speak different languages, they will be able to understand each other. But when they start talking about functions, they have to realize that they do that in different ways. So, there's something very important there because we talk about integrated STEM, sometimes in a very naive way because we overlook the fundamental difference in between them. And that's another word that we have to So, now let's go to the difference between engineering and technology. And I'm particularly talking about difference in education because to me, 
engineering is in fact the professional way of doing technology. So it's, it's very similar to me, but engineering is a profession, technology is what we all do. We all see things around us that don't function as we would like them, and so we all see technological challenges, and sometimes we also do design about it. And there's, there's always a very practical situation that we run into that we're not happy with, and that we can try to solve. So I, I, I take, for instance, uh, packing is a very nice example. You know, packing is also different, so something very difficult to get over. You know that probably when you have a package of meat or something like that, you say, where do I get that? <laughs> so it's, you might say it's bad design. It doesn't take an engineer to see that, we also see that. And it doesn't take an engineer to come up with solutions, we also do that. Maybe another fun example. Sometimes it's difficult to find the beginning of a tape. So you have to press you, you have to press it. That's maybe not a good design. <laughs> maybe you could do something like that. Or that's a toilet roll. Sometimes it's also difficult to find the beginning of that. So you look at it, you don't need to be an engineer to see that. It's technology. So to me, technology and engineering, the difference between them is that we all do technology, but engineers do it as a profession. And therefore, they have to learn much more about it, and they do it more quantitative, and they do it much more modeling, and they use more mathematics. So the engineers do it in a more sophisticated way, but technology is what we all do. And technology also includes the user, user perspective. So we also look at it as users. And technology engineers always about development. So, oops, sorry, I'm skipping something, I see. Um, now, let's, let's look at difference in more detail. That, so, that's the Communality, I think, that they're actually the same, but engineering is a professional domain. But that means that the engineers learn certain things that you don't do in technology necessarily. Engineering, as I said, is always about development. But technology is also about critical consumership. It's also looking critically at existing products. So, technology education is also about technological literacy. It is how to live in a technological world as a normal human being, not as an engineer. That's also technology education. Engineering is mostly quantitative, you do calculations, but technology education is very often qualitative. We put together simple Lego models, we try out whether it works, and if we don't do any calculations on it, we just try it out. It's very qualitative. Engineering heavily makes use of science and mathematics. In technology, we make more use of craft and art skills. So different domains from which we draw. Engineering heavily makes use of modeling, and also we discuss the models. So when you look at the model, is it appropriate? And we look very consciously at the difference between the model and the real thing. When we, I go to these aircraft people, they make little models that they put in wind tunnels, but they do realize that the relation between this small aircraft and the air molecules is much different than from a real aircraft and the air molecules. So their ratio is very different. So they take that into account when they make their calculations. So they discuss the nature of the model. In technology, we do a lot of modeling, but rarely do we discuss the relation between the model and reality. So we make a little toy car, but rarely we discuss what from reality did, did I put in the model and what did I leave out. Well, the toy car can move forward if I push it, but it doesn't have an engine that can drive it. Or maybe it can when it has uh, a little motor in it. A real car can take bursts with it. The toy car cannot. So there's a difference between the model and the reality. But I haven't seen many technology educators that ever discussed it. There are opportunities, but we don't use them. In engineering, you have to do that. Talk about the relation between the model and reality. Always look at which elements from reality did I take into my model, did I take more friction, did I it, etc. And that determines the value of the model, so you very consciously discuss the nature of the model. And I don't see technology teachers doing that. Their modeling is much more tinkering. Trying to, you put something together, you try it out, does it work? And it's a sort of modeling that you don't really discuss the nature of the model. Engineering is very specialized. We, we don't have a faculty of engineering. We have faculties of chemical engineering, electrical engineering, industrial engineering, etc. cetera. It's a whole row of very specialized disciplines. But in technology, we have technology education in general. And that's also the purpose, to show what general features does technology have. So it's much more about technological literacy, general knowledge about technology. So that's, and that's, of course, because this is a professional domain. 
Now, I'm aware of time, so I'm going to move a bit more quickly. What, this is my, my last point, if you how could we come to a real integration of these very different components? How can we come to a real integration? And my proposal would be to put design challenges at the core, because I think that is where it can all come together. Depending, of course, on how to do it, if we can find the proper assignments, but design is really where the things come together. Because in technology, we teach pupils how to go through the process. We teach them how you tackle a design problem. So you first have to look at the requirements, then you ask the solutions, then you go for a choice, you elaborate it, so you make it ready for production, etc. So the process of design is very much what we do. And we also have very specific knowledge about you know, the things that are typical for design. And the engineering can help us then to make that a bit more, let's say, a bit more conscious, a bit more mathematical, a bit more uh, scientific. So that, that can sort of enhance that design idea. The science can deliver us knowledge about the phenomena that makes the device work, which is very important, of course. If I have that knowledge, I can make sure that it works. And mathematics can help this element. How do we model it in such a way that it can be manipulated mathematically? That we can have, for example, a dynamic model that we can use for sort of, um, uh, sort of experiments in the computer. Of simulation than even the mathematics. So the, the, the design challenge is really where it comes together. The, the question then is what, what challenge do we need then? I'll come back, that will be my next point. So what will be the learning outcomes when we do that? A lot of century, 21st century skills that are related to design and research, or research and development, or whatever you want to call it. That's to me that is the main domain that is sort of an example of how to do that. And also we can get a better understanding of the basic concepts. So when we do this, a science teacher can be very happy because if you design, for instance, a boat, you have to know about sinking and floating. And so a deeper understanding of sinking and floating that the science teacher would like to see happening can be done by making pupils design the boat. Because if they make a boat based on a misconception and the boat sinks, then obviously their understanding is not correct. And they will be highly motivated to know how, what, what is their misunderstanding because this boat should float, so they have to find out how it works. And then a science teacher can step in and say, okay, let's find out what, what does the boat, what makes that the boat floats or sinks. Uh, people may say, well, size, large things will float, small things will sink. Look at the big oil tanker, look at the little nail that I put in the water, see large things float, small things sink. And the physics teacher knows how that works. But okay, design a big thing, big boat, look, there it goes. Oh, I made it big, but still it sinks, how can? Should I make it even bigger? No, 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 wait. <laughs> so yeah, you stop, you stop. Okay, okay, so it's not weight only. What, what more is it stuck then? Okay, it's a bit hollow, maybe that helps. So what, what difference does it make then? Oh, much lighter, still, same size. No, it's lighter, but it pushes away, still the same amount. Well, ah, now we're moving in a direction of Archimedes law, right? Can you feel where I'm going? And so the physics teacher will push that a little bit in that direction. But the real thing is that by, by doing this design activity, pupils have a much deeper understanding of Archimedes law. Because now they saw that boat sinking. And so you can see where the conceptual misunderstanding is. Because when the pupil explains why he designed the boat, then he starts telling you, well, I had to make it big, because big things float. Yeah, that's what we know. No, that's not the case. And you see that he can help the science teacher also. So, the learning outcomes will be that you really get a deeper understanding also of the science concepts. Also, of course, the technology concepts, like systems concepts, you can teach by design because everything is connected. You have to, of course, do that very consciously. You have to ask systems questions to the students, but you can do that. So there's all sorts of concepts that you can use in integrated way. Systems is something that is important in technology, but also in science. Biologists talk about ecosystems. Chemists talk about the chemical system with the balance in, 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 in the reaction. So modeling is something that we use in science, there's scientific modeling, there's engineering modeling, there's mathematical modeling, so it's the same thing in every domain. Materials and information is all around the place. Scientists do it their way, we look at it. Mathematics, particularly is interested in information, of course. So that's also concepts that we use in all three domains. 
So there's cross-cutting concepts that will help us build bridges between these domains. And these are concepts that you use in design. You look at your device from a systems point of view. You will model it first before you make the real thing. You will look at what kind of use it does it make of material energy information. And all these domains can contribute to it because they all deal with these concepts. So that's where you can build bridges between the concepts. Okay, I'm going to skip some things. I, I think that doing this will really bring about the excitement that the science teacher is looking for. And it gives real insights into the relation between the subjects. So I think this is really, really a way to go. Now we have done some work already in the Netherlands. Um, and we have learned some lessons already. I'm not going to tell this because we're almost out of time already. Uh, but we have learned something important, and that is that if you really want to do it, that word evening, my main message, you have to do it with all these teachers together. If you want to have a real integrated STEM activity, you have to have the different knowledge domains brought together by the people themselves. Even more, we have some experience with thematic modules that were developed not just by teachers, but also in cooperation with the engineers, the real experts in the field. So we had people working in, for instance, aircraft people. And they brought in their expertise in putting together educational modules. They're even deeper in that knowledge than any technology teachers. So it's very important to bring together the different kind of um, teachers. And yes, team teaching is problematic, so there's challenges there, but we somehow have to overcome. That's why this mutual understanding of each other's fields is so important. And that's where teacher education can play a role. So in Delft, we, as I said, we have these mixed group of students. So we can put together the, science, the future science teachers and the technology teachers and the mathematics teachers so that they can get an understanding of each other's fields. So um, not teach by one specialist teacher, but really do it uh, together. Um, and I think in the end, we will need teachers that are trained in new ways. So I think this has consequences for technology teacher education also, but also for science teacher education. I think we should have much more cooperation also at teacher education. So, that was it. I realized that I've thrown a whole bucket of information on your heads. So you may have the impression that this is what was my story. <laughs> but still, I hope uh, there is something in it that you can take with you, that you all have your own takeaways that you can take away from this presentation. And so, yeah, I'll probably you'll say, ah, oh, what exactly are we saying here? Well, that presentation will be available for you if you want. It's on the computer now, so you can always read it later. Uh, there's publications about that. So I hope that I've been able to, well, at least entertain you for some time and maybe give you some inspiration for your own work. Kishi. Valuable point in implementing STEM education. And, uh, and the second period, I would like to invite you to propose some question to Benchmark. I think you can speak Chinese, but I can try to translate it. If you can't, you can ask me. Oh, okay. uh, thanks, Mark. Uh, thanks for the wonderful presentation. I just have a, a procedure, procedural question about how to deliver the.